Welcome to this week's episode of Mummy Talks with me, Katrin Karongo. Today we discuss maternal sepsis, a life-threatening condition that results from infection during pregnancy, childbirth or postpartum. We are joined by Dr. Charles Murioki, a gynecologist at the MP Shah Hospital, to discuss this further. Let's start with the definition of maternal sepsis. What is it? So maternal sepsis, according to WHO, is defined as um, a dysfunction of one organ or more as a result of an infection, usually bacterial but could also be viral, or as a response to, or as an effect of a response to the body fighting that infection. And usually it would compromise uh, the mother's condition. Um, so generally that is what would define as uh, sepsis. What are the risk factors to maternal sepsis? So there are a couple of risk factors that could actually lead to sepsis, but uh, first and foremost, pregnancy is an immune suppressive state. So generally women uh, being pregnant would actually be at risk of getting an infection. Um, in addition to that, sometimes you might find women might have other conditions that lower the immunity. For instance, diabetes, um, HIV infection, um, but even increased BMI, okay, uh, or generally what you call as obesity, a body mass index, or, or they're overweight, that could actually put them at risk. But generally would say, uh, in and itself, pregnancy itself is, is an immune suppressive state. Sometimes you might find that women who, for one reason or the other, before pregnancy, mm -hmm. for instance, they had uh, a low blood level, what you call anemia, for a long while. So that also puts them at risk. Or during the pregnancy itself, for one reason or the other, or during the labor itself, there could be an event that puts them at risk. For instance, if their waters uh, break before time, um, or if, uh, for one reason or the other, they go into labor before time because of a urine infection or something of that sort, that also predisposes them to, to getting an infection. Sometimes as a result of uh, the delivery process. So having a surgery, for instance, what is called a cesarean section, does put somebody at risk of, of an infection. Or for one reason or the other, there was a complication that required an intervention, um, either surgical or uh, non-surgical. Uh, generally would put a lady at, at risk of infection. So at what point does one develop maternal sepsis? Is it immediately after delivery or is it a, a specific time period? That yeah, that's a good question. So sometimes people assume that infection, you know, would happen after delivery. And actually that's the commonest uh, time that people would get an, an infection because at that point in time, generally after delivery, there is risk uh, because of, you know, um, the uterus still being uh, um, not gone back to its normal size. And uh, it can happen at up to six weeks after delivery. Um, but generally we also think about infection being able to still occur even in pregnancy mm -hmm. and during the labor process. So there are telltale signs and, and that's why it's important to have uh, uh, the patient or the woman you know, visit the clinic uh, for checks because sometimes something subtle as a urine infection that goes undetected and, and not treated can trigger labor before time and actually can end up with uh, an infection. So uh, much as uh, most of infections happen after delivery, we know that there could be um, uh, pregnant women who develop their sepsis mm -hmm. during pregnancy. What are the symptoms that one can identify and know that they may have maternal sepsis? So the, the symptoms can be quite non-specific and, and it's important to note that uh, some women will just report uh, feeling unwell, a general malay, um, but uh, some do actually notice that there are specific uh, things that they would pick, for instance a fever, sometimes they might notice that they are, uh, they are breathing fast, an increased uh, rate of uh, breathing. Um, some might notice for one reason or the other that they might be having uh, pain in the tummy or pain when passing urine. Now depending on where the infection is, most, of, most often than not it's in the uterus or around the uterus. So they might have pain in the lower abdomen or they might have an offensive uh, vaginal discharge. Um, some might actually have infection spreading to the rest of the body. Um, and in this case, if you were to look at the technical term of sepsis, that means that they are also are having the dysfunction in another organ. So they might have breathing difficulties if the infection has gone to, to the chest. Um, if they have issues with 
uh, their blood pressure. They may notice the blood pressure is low. Some might actually have, um, you know, what we call loss of consciousness or altered mental status because the infection is so severe, it's affecting their brain function. Some might notice that they might have, you know, they can't be able to pass urine as frequent because their kidneys are affected. But um, from a clinical perspective, uh, as doctors, we'll notice that there are those things that we call the vital signs that would be uh, off for one reason or the other. So a low blood pressure, either the fe there's a fever, the temperature is too high or too low, um, the pulse rate is increased, okay, or for one reason or the other, the, the body is not functioning, one organ is not functioning well. So there's a decreased urine output, uh, the, the oxygen to the body is reduced. Um, so there is a wide spectrum from uh, one end of just general feeling unwell mm -hmm. to the other end of the spectrum where somebody's organs are actually not functioning well. You've mentioned about offensive vaginal discharge. Just explain a little more about it. What is it? So generally when there is a bacterial infection in the genital tract, um, uh, there is uh, a reaction with the body and actually you might notice that most women will complain on uh, I notice that there is an abnormal vaginal discharge. Abnormal would be termed as uh, any discharge that is not clear or, and, doesn't ha and, and, and has an abnormal smell. So generally in pregnancy, any discharge that is not clear or has an abnormal smell would be uh, a cause for alarm. And it would be important to have this evaluated by a doctor to, to exactly know what is the cause of this. Because sometimes it may be a telltale sign. And actually that may be the early sign to be able to pick uh, an infection that's brewing inside the uterus and you know, requires treatment, an urgent treatment at that. Do you see a lot of mothers with, or a lot of patients with maternal sepsis here? And how are the statistics like countrywide? So, I mean, the, 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 the presentation and the, and the statistics can be varied depending on, you know, which facility uh, we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, public facilities generally would see much more and private facilities might be probably on the left side because of um, just the healthcare seeking, the health health seeking behavior of of patients. Um, but generally, would say in our country, we probably have 13 out of 100 women who actually do um, succumb to to maternal sepsis. So that probably points to the fact that the numbers are actually higher, um, assuming that you don't lose all the women. That's and that's our goal. But even globally, we probably talk about, uh, WHO puts it around 15 in 100. So generally you would say the numbers are actually uh, higher, given that actually, you know, some actually don't even come to hospital or maybe they, they, they have complications and don't even make it to hospital, unfortunately. And how can one reduce the chances of, or the risk of contracting or getting maternal sepsis? So, there are a couple of things that you would be able to say are modifiable risk factors and some are not modifiable. For instance, if somebody's immunity is reduced, let's say they had diabetes before pregnancy, or for instance, you know, uh, they had HIV infection that is not, uh, uh, you know, something that they can change. But generally would say a, a good assessment prior to pregnancy is important to exactly know are there risk factors that, you know, can be changed. For instance, try and modify um, uh, the diet and, and encourage exercise to reduce you know weight that would be one of those simple things but generally you would look at it and say there aren't so many modifiable risk factors I mean the fact that somebody is pregnant already puts them in an immune compromised state um, so you probably would say that the most important thing would be to have a high index of suspicion to be able to pick up a, any early signs of maternal sepsis and be able to address uh, uh, the disease or the condition before it gets uh, to a point where complications arise. Can it interfere with future pregnancies? Yes, indeed, of course it can. Um, and, and the sad thing is that uh, this can actually be uh, unnoticed because if there is infection inside the uterus, mm -hmm. for one reason or the other, the, the infection can track up uh, into the tubes and, and into the pelvis. And most women will later on sometimes have pain, uh, you know, that is non-specific, what you call chronic pelvic pain, mm -hmm. pain that is always there, whether it's during the uh, menses or not. But that infection damaging the tubes actually cause, causes tubal blockage, or there could be an infection that damages the uterus. So that might interfere with the function of the tube and the function of the uterus. 
unfortunately in some circumstances we've been forced to remove the uterus for one reason or the other maybe the infection is too severe and we have no choice to but to remove the uterus to save the mother's life so that definitely does render a woman unable to uh, get children naturally what other complications can it lead to so other complications that it can lead to um, generally would be uh, complications of the you know other organs uh, uh, of the body so for one for instance if there is infection that's severe in, in the body it can affect the functioning of the brain and some actually might really need to uh, be put on some uh, oxygen support. Uh, there are others who might have breathing issues as I said and they also will need oxygen support if there is an issue of the blood pressure because the infection sometimes does uh, you know complicate with the blood pressure being lower then they they actually need medication to be able to keep the blood pressure high and all this has to be done in an, in an ICU setting. Unfortunately, even the kidneys sometimes are affected and women may not have um, a good functioning of the kidneys to the point that they might actually need dialysis. So the, the spectrum actually is wide depending at what point the disease was picked and at what point you know, the disease had spread in terms of uh, to the rest of the body and to the other organs. So generally would say complications usually would require um, either a surgical intervention mm -hmm. um, with or without um, requiring ICU care. Yeah. Is it treatable? Yes, so maternal sepsis in and of itself, depending on at what point and what stage it's picked, uh, is treatable. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are times when the infection, you know, is deemed to have spread throughout the rest of the body. And, and, and in that case, you know, we'll say that you know, the horse has bolted and you might not be able to do much. You, you're actually chasing a train on turbo. So it's very difficult to actually control that. But if it's picked early, uh, generally would uh, think of a prompt uh, treatment with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And antibiotics um, have to be um, precise in the sense that uh, the doctor must be able to know what uh, potential bacteria they're treating and, and, and target this with specific antibiotics. They will also need what is called supportive treatment. Supportive treatment basically means that because the infection has affected the rest of the body uh, in terms of the other organs and their functioning, that you need to support these organs as the body is fighting the infection. So as I earlier alluded to the fact that they might need ICU care, you know, for breathing uh, or using, you know, a ventilator. Sometimes they might need dialysis to support their kidneys. Um, so this is what we call supportive care. Sometimes these uh, patients actually might need even nutrition through the veins and, and fluids to actually maintain their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of supportive care that is also needed um, for one reason or the other. If the infection is deemed severe such that the antibiotic treatment might not uh, suffice, then you might uh, have a patient requiring uh, a surgical intervention either to remove uh, the, the, the source of the infection and to control it. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, that sometimes does necessitate uh, requiring to remove the uterus. So the final question that's not really related to maternal sepsis, but it's about access to information. We see a lot of mothers seeking information online, which may or may not be correct information. What would be your advice? What can one look out for when they're seeking information online? Yeah, I think that's a challenge we have as as, um, as as a society because I think the increased access to internet has made people feel that they could be able to access uh, medical information and I think it's a good thing that people can be able to access medical information. The only challenge we usually have is um, what is out there is not validated. I mean, it's not an, it's not all information that's good information and uh, some of this information is actually not written by medical experts. So while it's important maybe to have an idea and probably the best would be to try and get information from validated uh, sites. You know, validated sites can be difficult to know, but generally information that is given out by um, public health organizations and uh, non-governmental organizations like the WHO, um, countries sometimes do have um, public health uh, measures that uh, that probably put out that information there. So there are websites that are actually from different colleges. For instance, uh, a college of obstetrics and gynecology can have information, and they're usually in patient leaflet uh, format. 
Um, and, and the reason why I say that is generally the, the information um, might be non-specific to that condition or might be uh, too much or might be misleading. Thank you so much. Anything else you'd like to add on maternal sepsis? I think it's just to um, try and ensure that uh, you know we, we, we have um, the proper um, access to the information but also emphasizing that most of the challenges we have is actually not in the treatment because we talk about delays in, 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 in our context. And, and one of the delays uh, we, we, we first and foremost you know, address is the delay in making the decision to uh, seek medical care. And, and the second delay usually is um, the delay in actually getting to uh, the medical facility. So there may be challenges either in, in terms of transport to be able to get to the medical facility. And the third delay, which is on our side, is the delay in initiating the treatment. So I think if we were to try and focus on, on those three delays, then we may be able to mitigate the effects of maternal sepsis. Thank you for staying with us. We hope that today's episode has been of great insight to you. Remember, as Dr. Morioki has said, early diagnosis is the key to treatment for maternal sepsis. Join us again next week for yet another insightful episode where we talk about breastfeeding with style as we mark the World Breastfeeding Week. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.